heads are done in the oven, I'll bring them in here and uh, set them up right here so we can go ahead and dry them in the guides. Uh, one thing I'm going to do, which might be a little bit abnormal, is I'm going to be using this cup and filling it up with liquid nitrogen and dropping the uh, valve guides into the nitrogen. While it won't create a uh, just a slip fit, it will make driving them in a little bit easier. And I surmise because these guides are so short, especially on the exhaust side, that the interference fit might be a little bit tighter than normal. So, uh, let me get that set up and I'll be back. Here's the liquid nitrogen. Uh, valve guides are already in it, so I'm going to set it off camera. Uh, right about there, it's a safe spot. And let me go get the cylinder head. The way that I'll be doing this is using the air hammer, uh, the, the driving tool that I've got that's set to the correct depth. And step one will be using the brush. Step one will be using the brush, just lubricating the guides just a little bit. Because it's still going to be an interference fit between the two. Now to get the guides out of the liquid nitrogen, I just have some needle nose and I'm going to use to reach down in there. And now that it's settled down, I can see through it so I can see which guides I'm, I'm reaching for. I'm going to start with the exhaust guides and then go to the intake guides. Now this head has some powder on it and what that's from is uh, the baking soda that I used to blast the chambers. So we got that. And I reach down in here and go for an exhaust guide. Nope. There we go, we got an exhaust guide. And put it on the tool. Stick it down in the guide hole and hammer away. You see that still took a bit of hammering. Partly because the tool that I use here, it actually takes quite a bit of the force away. All right, so let's go for the second one. Oh, grab the wrong end. Now this air hammer too is not the uh, the most powerful one. I like it because of the, the control it gives me. I could have a long stroke, but this is just a short stroke. I'd rather go in slow and easy. Five on the exhaust guides. Wow, 
last exhaust guide. So I'm going to rotate the head around so I can access the intakes and then install them. They should go in a lot easier because if you remember, they're actually pretty short compared to the exhaust guides. Now I can just grab any guide that's down in there because there's only one type. It took quite a bit less time. Oh, missed it. And they're all in. I'm going to go through and just verify a couple of them just to double check that the uh, heights are right. Looking good. Looks like we're about 335 to 340. Only about a 5,000th difference. Of course, it's not the most accurate way to measure this but it works pretty well so that's installing the valve guides uh, next thing we'll be doing is uh, hitting the top of the guides with a tapered ream I've got that mounted up in the drill here and that's just in case it closed off the top of the guide just a little bit which is uh, normal when you're using an air hammer and from there we're going to be going to the seat and guide machine to cut the valve seats and finish the job up Oh, yeah, got to ground the intake valves too, so we'll see you when we get set up for that. Something that I've run into when I was testing the fit between the guide and the valve stem is the valve. Uh, these are the original OEM valves that are, that came with the head from the customer. Well, a couple of them don't fit so good. So I'm going to put it underneath the microscope, hopefully get the right, there we go. And I think I found an issue, and it might be from how they disassembled it. If they used a hammer, they nicked up the, uh, the top of the guide, or top of the valve. There we go, if we can keep that, there we go. And I saw a high spot right, I know it's very insignificant, but there's a spot right there. And then if I roll it some more, there's another spot right there. I'm actually catching the tip on this. So this is a high spot and it's possible it came from the locks, but because it's got, looks like, looks like what a strike mark that kind of goes through here and then maybe down through here. Uh, it might've been just how they disassembled it. So I'm gonna have to get a little bit of crocus cloth to clean up this top piece and uh, make sure that it, it goes through. So whenever you're disassembling your heads, if you're gonna use a hammer, you need to think about uh, what damage can be done. While it seems very insignificant, uh, it, it could damage the guides as they, as they fo force these valves through. So be careful with that. Here at the seat and guide machine, so we've got our valve guides installed. I went ahead and honed them a little bit because they were tight down through the casting, which is normal and under normal situation or an OEM type replacement, 
that's uh, that's considered you know within specification but because this one here is destined for a little bit of performance I went ahead and made sure that the valve guides are not only you know to size but they're also cylindrical on the inside because in uh, while the the valve guide is engaged in the casting uh, it actually gets compressed a little bit so it kind of looks like an hourglass if you consider the full length of the valve guide so I honed them out about half a thousandth of an inch which uh, established the, the, that cylindricity of the uh, of the guide ID so we're set up over here on the seat and guide machine we've got the the seat cutter right here and uh, it's a one millimeter uh, wide intake seat and we'll be cutting it just enough to get the uh, the seat machined all the way around because we're reusing the original valves on this one and I don't want to machine them down too deep because then my valve tip height will be much too long and I can't take too much off the tip of the valve <clears throat> so go ahead and start this up let me clamp down the cradle here So we'll go ahead and turn on the machine and get cutting here. And you can hear in it, it's a little bit off center and that's just because the new guide going through the casting, they rarely go in perfectly. I have the seat cut all the way around and I don't see any of the original uh, exposed seat material I'm going to set my depth there it's actually very close to the other head that I've done already and uh, just do a quick inspection looks like we've got it cut all the way around just right I go ahead and blow the seat out blow the port out and then move over to the next one Pull the pilot out here. And this is a tapered dead pilot system, so the valve the valve guide has to fit the pilot properly. So I can't just you know drop a drop a pilot in the valve guide and call it good. It actually has to fit it properly. Of course, on the live pilot ones too, they do need to fit properly. They can't be too loose or too tight. So let me float this over to the next hole. Get it there roughly, then I'm going to put the pilot back in and I'm going to press it down into the, into the guide because I don't want the pilot to rotate, I just want the tool to rotate on the pilot. Put that down in there and I'm going to float it and bring the ball head down against the uh, so we have this as a one inch ball drive. It's got a single drive pin. I'm going to bring the, the spindle down to it. Let the pin engage. And then that one inch ball is actually what centers everything. And this is, uh, this is why, so this pilot that this cutter body's on is actually made out of uh, tungsten carbide. So it's a, it's a pretty hard material. It is brittle, yes, and you do run the risk of snapping them if you don't treat them well. But what's happening is this, this ball head that's up inside here is engaged on a one inch ID uh, drive, uh, drive coupler. And because this, this whole head assembly is on a fixture that air floats, you bring the spindle down onto it and you let it float and this pilot is actually what's centering the cylinder head to the spindle. 
So the, you can use a, uh, a high-speed steel pilot like this one here. This is just a grinding pilot. And these just don't have the same strength to them. So any slight deviation in the head, if the head wants to you know, slide this way or that way or, or back or forth, or even how the head sits down once you release the air, uh, it, it doesn't, it makes it very difficult to con cut a concentric seat. All right, so I've got that. I'm going to go ahead and reclamp the head and then cut the second one. And I've got the head mounted on the fixture so that all these seats as I go down will actually be cut to the same depth and that should produce the same valve tip on or valve height on the top side of the head. So you can hear on this one, it's actually pretty concentric. Now some machines will run the spindle faster. This machine prefers a slow speed, possibly because it's not as rigid as the new ones, or it could be something in the spindle, but I can cut a very concentric seat with a little bit of time and some patience. I don't see any of any of the original valve seat material. All right, I'll back it off and then off to the next one. We'll blow this one out. Unlock it first. Bring it out this way, then we'll go ahead and swap the pilot and the cutter over to the next hole. You just have to do this in succession down the length of the head. Now, before I get going on these, I actually check to see if the uh, pilot or the valve guides are all at about the same center line meaning if one pilot goes in you know one way and then the other one goes in the other way just kind of an exaggeration i'll make note of that because there are some heads that when the guides go in the pilots they seem to go in all different different ways now i'm only talking about a you know a slight difference and that slight difference keeps me from cutting a concentric seat on this machine right over here Let's see that spindle come down again. Engages the ball. And make sure that the cutter is not engaged in the valve seat. Okay, and I see if the, if the ball goes up and down inside the drive smoothly and without any catching, then I know that I'm on center. Okay, so let's take a look at the seat cutting. I'll zoom in there and try and get it focused. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and clamp it now. And this keeps the, the fixture from moving because the only thing that's holding it without this clamp is the weight of the fixture and it's pretty heavy and the friction of the fixture against the table. depth and all the original surface is gone. I'll we'll knock the chips out, I'll blow them out. Okay. 
All right, for the next one, I'm gonna try and get a shot straight down at it, see if we can uh, get a kind of a bird's eye view. So let me get that set up. Here we are set up the seat, trying to do a tight shut. Let's see how good this goes. depth and all the original surface has been bored and let's take a look at the seat get the spring out of the way and everything and you can see right in there it looks pretty good I think I'll overlay some shots of the after there so that's machine and seats. I just got one more to do and then I got to do the exhaust and they're going to go pretty much the same as the intake. And um, once I do that, I've got to set the valve tip height. So I'll bring you back when I get to that point. All right, see you later. Here we are on my other valve grinder. This is a 32. It's a centerless valve grinder. And what that means is that the valve is being held on its own center line, not the center line of a spindle. Like Quickways and Sue and some ver and, uh, and versions of the, uh, what's it called, Rottlers, the Black and Deckers, they all grab onto the valve with a collet and that collet spins in a spindle. That spindle then defines the, the, the path in which that valve is gonna rotate on. So those are really good if you have valves with worn valve stems and you need to reuse them because they're going to grind a, a, a round seat or a concentric seat with, uh, with some arbitrary axis. Uh, and any of the, uh, the valve to guide clearance, the, the valve stem to guide clearance, if it's, if it's anything at all, that valve will then still be able to seal. Now on these here, this is what's called a centerless. That means the valve is actually going to rotate on V-blocks. The V-blocks are located right here. The chuck opens up and the V-block or the valve goes in here. And on this one, the valve is actually sitting vertically. So it sits vertically inside the machine and the, um, oh, hold on and the, the grinding motor or grinding wheel actually traverses up and down. So this one works really well. Again, I'm running it dry for demonstration purposes, but I'll chuck up the valve and uh, you'll see the drive motor is down on the bottom. So it pushes up on the bottom of the valve and it actually drives it with a coupling and it's basically a big, um, I don't know if it's rubber or something, but it's got a large soft pliable coupling that drives the valve from the bottom. The valve is located on a turkite button here and then V-ways that are lined with turkite. So let me bring in close and we'll grind a valve or two. All right, let's go ahead and turn it on and we'll grind a valve. You can see the valve's rotating and I control the speed of the valve. And then we'll turn on the grinding motor. I'm gonna true the valve, or true the grinding wheel. There we go, and it's got a diamond that traverses across it. And then back it up. Okay, so let's get the grinding.
Any day now. There we go. Change out the valve as I just push the button. The valve releases, and I grab the next one. Put it in. There we go. And do the next one. on the face. And that's grinding valves. Uh, it's got a pretty good face on it. Okay. Alright, so let's go ahead and do a farther out shot. Let's do a couple of valves this way. Lock, now the motor and the grinder. Alright, so let's try and do it from the side here. Open up the chuck, put the valve in. He grabs it and away we go. I'll roll it up. Slowly, I'm actually dropping the motor down this, or dropping the, the grinding wheel down this way. And the same thing as the other one is I don't want the, the grinding wheel to come off the end of the face because that's normally when it starts to chatter. And here it's starting to come in. This one again, this one had some run out on the face also. There we go. I'll take this one out. And then the next one. Now these machines here are actually, in my opinion, really good other than the control system that Serti installed. It used a lot of edge board connectors and they passed a lot of current through it which caused the traces on the circuit board to fail. And when they fail, you know, the machines junk to most people. I actually purchased this one pretty cheap off of Craigslist. So, I like it. I just retrofitted the system and the only thing that really needed control uh, was the, any electronic interface was the angle measurement. So in the back of the machine, there's actually an encoder. If I remember right, it was a Heidenhain encoder. So it was a really expensive one. But to get any information off of it, I had to take the machine apart to access it. <clears throat> So once I took it apart, I figured out which one it was, and then I uh, got the specs and used an Arduino to read the quadrature encoder. And there we go. May not be as snazzy as the original one. You know, I don't move it very often, but when I do, I just have to start the system and I actually drop the, the grinding motor, grinding head, all the way down to a stop and that ends up being 15.9 degrees and then I go up from there.
This one wasn't very bad at all. Two left. I've already done two, so that's why we're only doing ten here. Of course, I think we've done ten. I just need to count. This one too had quite a bit of run out. I'd say probably about two two thousandths run out on the face. Which isn't too bad, because uh, if I understood it correctly, this cylinder had actually had a burnt exhaust valve, which meant the combustion chamber temperatures were high enough to melt an exhaust valve. And surely that was high enough to at least distort some intake valves a little bit. But I might be wrong about that. Either way. go. Open the truck and we're all done. We're down to the last step on our Subaru EGEZ heads and from up to this point right here, these valves have just gone over because I do use them when I'm on the seat and guide machine to get uh, to make sure that they're sealing and make sure they're concentric. And what I'm going to be doing now is setting them for valve tip height. Uh, and once I do that, they are stuck in this position. They, they shouldn't be moved around because the slight differences between the two, be it a different grind on the valve face or a different, slightly different depth on the valve seat cut. Uh, if you take a valve that, say, took off more on the face, put it in a valve seat that, you know, it was uh, bored deeper than the one next to it or the one it came from, then that valve tip height might be excessive. Or if you swap those two where a valve face didn't need a lot of machining and a valve seat didn't need a lot, you'll come up with a short, uh, a short valve, tip, uh, valve, valve tip height. So I've got the gauge, just like we'd used uh, measuring it before disassembly. Now on the exhaust side, we've had a little change in the game plan here. These are actually 70 thousandths of an inch larger. So the valve tip height on these is gonna be, uh, you know, how we had set it at zero on this for the 1.225. These are gonna be 1.295, which will be, you know, a plus 70. So it should go around to the 70 thousandths mark on the dial indicator. Uh, so let's get this set up and I'll show you how I'm going to do the measurement. So the valves are in there and I'm just going to stick the, uh, the indicator in through the, through the top of the head while I'm holding, holding the valve. And it looks like, you know, well, here we go. We might be able to see that there. There we go. So we can see on this one, uh, our zero, get that leveled in there. There we go. Looks like we need to remove about three thousandths off the tip of this valve. There we go. Okay, so I'll remove three thousandths off the tip of that one and then we'll have, hopefully have it hit zero. I'll be right back. So let's install that and see what we got now. Should be pretty darn close. And remember, because these are hydraulic lash adjusters, we have some leeway. All right, looks like it didn't take off enough. So let me take off another foul and uh, then okay, set this and right there. Let's see if we can get in that shot. There we go. So remember the the zero isn't straight up. You know, use this gauge for something else. So it's slightly off to the side, say about the one, two o'clock position. So here's our second one back and it's gonna be six thousandths off of the face. There we go. So there's six thousandths. And this is the process I'm gonna follow through each one of them as I go down the head on the intake and on the exhaust. And, you know, it's just getting the tip height within specifications so that the lash adjuster will work as, as intended. So let me show you a bit of the, the actual tip grinding um, process for this one here. 
Here we are over here at the other valve grinder and really what this one is is just a tip grinder now. This is a, a Sioux 645 that had a problem with the chuck. The chuck was really worn out from gripping a lot of different valves. I mean a lot of valves and then the ways were also worn out so as it as the uh, as, as the components traversed they, they racked a little bit so the angles were hard to keep straight because the, uh, the, the guideways in it were messed up. So it has this V block right here that rotates past uh, the grinding wheel. The valve gets clamped into the into the into the V block, and you just feed it in with a, a micrometer feed in over here on the side. So I'll go ahead and grind off about six thousandths off of this tip. about one thousandth of an inch bite or cuts on this. Four, five, and six. Now when I'm done cutting all of them, obviously they've got a really square uh, head on them. I do chamfer the ends of them so that they'll, uh, they'll have a nice edge break on the corner to make them a little bit less resistant to crack, a little bit more resistant to cracking. So we've come to the end of my involvement on the Subaru H6 cylinder heads. I've already set the valve tip height on these and on the other one I will be finishing it up to setting the valve tip on it, valve tip height. I won't be assembling them so that'll be up to the customer to build. Uh, with uh, their old intake valves and the new exhaust valves and whatever cams they're using and whatever buckets I'm just putting it back to within specifications so it should be it should be acceptable um, hopefully well beyond acceptable that's what I try to do here and I guess that's everything so we'll see you next time